tonight. Congress hopeful. India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party crosses the majority mark in the Haryana state. One year later, Harris and Trump mark somber anniversary of Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. Deepening conflict. Hezbollah fires rockets at Haifa as Israel expands ground invasions of Lebanon. And neuron wonder. A new wearable stroke rehabilitation device aims to help patients regain motor control. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. With the latest updates across the globe for this Tuesday, I'm Amasha Fernando. And let's take a look at the latest updates in neighbouring India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party is leading in the northern state of Haryana, but looks set to fall short in Indian-administered Kashmir, as votes are counted in two state elections. An opposition alliance formed by the Congress of the Regional Party National Conference is currently ahead in Jammu and Kashmir. These were the first state polls to be held in India since the general election, which returned the BJP to power in June with a reduced majority. A potential win in Haryana would be a big boost for Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party, as it would allow it to form a government for a third straight term. A BJP win would also go completely against exit polls, which had predicted a landslide for Congress in Haryana. The exit polls had also indicated a a hung assembly in Jammu and Kashmir, but if trends hold, the Congress NC coalition will be in a position to form the government. Both states have 90 assembly seats, and a party or coalition that crosses the halfway mark can form the government. According to votes counted so far, the Congress NC alliance is ahead in around 49 seats in Jammu and Kashmir, while the BJP is ahead in 29. The BJP's count is being helped by its performance in the Hindu majority Jammu region. These numbers may change as more votes are counted. This was the first assembly assembly election to be held in Jammu and Kashmir since 2019, when the federal government revoked the region's autonomy and changed it into a federally governed territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The three-phase election saw top leaders from the BJP and Congress make several promises, including the restoration of full statehood. Many voters said they had hoped the election would give them a chance to voice their concerns after having no local representatives for years. However, many say they are skeptical about how much influence the elected government will have, since the chief minister will have have to get the federally appointed lieutenant governor's approval on major decisions. Russian and Chinese Navy warships have practiced anti-submarine missions in the northwestern Pacific Ocean as part of a joint patrol in the Asia-Pacific region. A tactical group of warships maneuvered and formed a marching order to organize anti-submarine defense. Russia's Interfax agency cited the press service of the Russian Pacific Fleet. The ministry reported that Russian and Chinese Navy ships have begun joint patrols after participating in the Beibu Interaction 2024 naval exercises in September. A number of training sessions and combat training exercises were planned during the patrol missions. The ministry reported including organizing anti-submarine defense and rescue at sea. The Defense Ministry did not provide a timeline of the exercises. From the Russian side, the large anti-submarine destroyers Admiral Panteleev and Admiral Tributes of the Pacific Fleet participated. The ministry reported that China was represented by the destroyers Qining and Wuxi, the frigate Linyi and the integrated supply ship Taihu. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has sent a birthday message to Russian President Vladimir Putin, calling him his closest comrade. Kim, congratulating Putin on his 72nd birthday, added that relations between both countries would be raised to a new level. Relations between Pyongyang and Moscow have deepened since the start of the Ukraine war, in a move that has worried the West. Separately, Kim said Pyongyang would speed up steps to make his country a military superpower within nuclear weapons. Kim praised the relations between both countries, saying they had become invincible and eternal since Putin's visit to Pyongyang in June. Meetings and camaraderie ties between them will make a positive contribution to further 
further consolidating the eternal foundation of the DPRK Russia friendship, he added, referring to North Korea by its official name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Earlier this year, Putin and Kim signed an agreement pledging that they would help each other in the event of aggression against either country, though it was unclear what would constitute aggression. Kim has been accused of helping Russia in the war against Ukraine by supplying it with weapons in exchange for economic and technological assistance. There has been growing evidence that Russia has been deploying North Korean missiles in Ukraine. Jeffrey Lewis, a director at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, had earlier said both Kim and Putin were trying to reduce the pain of international sanctions by creating an alternate network of friends and partners beyond the reach of U.S. sanctions. During a visit by Kim to Russia in September last year, Putin had also promised to help North Korea develop its satellites after several failed launches by Pyongyang. And over in Albania now, anti-government protesters clashed with the police in the capital of Tiara in Albania. The protesters demanded that their government be replaced by a technocratic caretaker cabinet before the next year's parliamentary election. Opposition supporters in Albania violently clashed with police during a protest, demanding their government be replaced by a caretaker cabinet before next year's parliamentary election. The Conservative opposition have in the past accused Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama's socialists of corruption, voter manipulation and usurping powers of the country's judiciary. They have staged sometimes violent protests against the government since 2013. After a colleague was convicted of slander and imprisoned in a case they consider politically motivated, the Democratic Party of former Prime Minister Sali Berisha has been holding protests outside the Albanian parliament for the last week. Both the US and European Union have urged opposition to resume dialogue with the government saying that violence won't help the country integrate with the 27-nation EU bloc. Later this month, Tirana will start discussion with the EU on how the country aligns with the bloc stances on rule of law, democratic institutions and the fight against corruption. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news right after this. And on the road to the White House now, ahead of presidential elections, former President Donald Trump marked October 7th at a memorial in Queens, New York. While in Washington, Vice President Kamala Harris planted a pomegranate tree as a symbol of hope. But even on this solemn day, the campaigning crept in, Trump insisting on a radio show that if he had been president last October, he somehow could have prevented the surprise massacre. It would never have happened guaranteed. Even Democrats admit it. I saw some congressmen the other day said that wouldn't have happened. Harris was pressed on the cost of her plans, which include a $50,000 tax break for startups. 60 Minutes was planning to interview Trump as well, but he backed out last week. A new analysis from the Nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget finds that both candidates' plans would add to the debt, though Trump's could cost twice as much, thanks in part to his proposed tariffs on foreign goods. Just go out and vote. Get everybody and vote. At a rally in Wisconsin last night, he suggested that his supporters might hurt any Harris backers in their midst. Also once again in the U.S., the storm caused by Hurricane Milton grew rapidly after forming in the Gulf of Mexico. It is expected to make landfall overnight and evacuation orders are growing with hundreds of thousands still to leave. This is the strongest hurricane in the Gulf in nearly two decades and it's headed directly toward Florida, the Tampa Bay area and much of the Gulf Coast of Florida racing tonight. Urgent warnings at this hour, mass evacuations. The hurricane spinning over the record warm waters of the Gulf, about 675 miles from Tampa. Set to make landfall, you can see the track right there Wednesday night or in the early morning hours of Thursday. The new forecast just in tonight, they're now warning of a potential historic storm surge up to 15 feet. 
The Tampa area, as I mentioned, in the bullseye, just as they still clear away debris from Helene. They are warning Milton's storm surge could be far worse. In Dade City tonight and in so many other Florida communities, families are racing to protect their homes, preparing for widespread power outages, waiting in long lines all ready for gas. Tonight, hundreds of thousands are under mandatory evacuations, officials begging them to obey this. Heavy traffic headed inland on I-275. This is over Tampa Bay. And updating you on the conflicts in the Middle East now, Israel's military said that it had begun ground operations in southwestern Lebanon. The regional tensions triggered a year ago by Palestinian armed group Hamas's attack on southern Israel have spiraled to a string of Israeli operations by land and air over Lebanon and direct attacks by Iran onto Israeli military installations. Iran warned Israel on Tuesday against any attacks on the Islamic Republic a week after Tehran fired a barrage of missiles on it, putting the Middle East on edge. Foreign Minister Abbas Araki said that any attack on Iran's infrastructure will be met with retaliation, warning Israel against against attacks on his country. Arakchi will visit Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East starting today to discuss regional issues and work on stopping Israel's crimes in Gaza and Lebanon. Gulf states have sought to reassure Iran of their neutrality in the Iran-Israel conflict. In Lebanon, the Israeli military piled more pressure on Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah, saying it was conducting limited, localized, targeted operations in Lebanon's southwest after announcing such operations for the southeast border area. Israel's military struck Beirut southern suburbs overnight and said it killed a senior Hezbollah commander responsible for the group's budgeting and logistics. If confirmed, the death of Suhail Hussein Husseini would be the latest in a string of Israel's assassinations of leaders and commanders of Hezbollah and its ally Hamas, which has been fighting Israel in Gaza for a year. In the biggest blow to Hezbollah in decades, Israel killed its leader Hassan Nasrallah with an airstrike in Beirut's southern suburbs late last month. The United Nations Special Coordinator for Lebanon and the head of UN's peacekeeping mission in the country said that their repeated appeals for restraint had gone unheeded in the year since the exchanges of fire began between Hezbollah and Israel. Today, one year later, the near-daily exchanges of fire have escalated into a relentless military campaign whose humanitarian impact is nothing short of catastrophic, they said in a joint statement. Attacks have raised fears that the US, Israel's closest ally, and the Islamic Republic of Iran would be sucked into a full-blown conflict in the oil-producing Middle East. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hit out at French Prime Minister Emmanuel Macron for saying that shipments of arms to Israel used in the conflict in Gaza should be stopped. Israel continued to launch deadly strikes on Gaza on Sunday, coming just after its Prime Minister hit out at France's president for saying arms sales to Israel for use in the Strip should be stopped. In the video statement released by his office on Saturday, Benjamin Netanyahu also stressed that his country will fight until the battle is won. His response came after French President Emmanuel Macron addressed the escalating conflict at a summit of French-speaking nations. Macron repeated his country's solidarity with the security of Israel and expressed sympathy for the families of victims and hostages ahead of a year since Hamas's deadly October 7 attacks. He then called for arms shipments to be used in Gaza to be halted as part of a broader effort to find a political solution to the war that has since shattered the enclave. France is not a major weapons provider for Israel, shipping about $33 million worth of military equipment last year, according to an annual report by its defense ministry. The summit also issued a unanimous statement of solidarity with Lebanon and a call for a halt to fighting. Earlier, Macron told France Inter Radio that his country's priority now is to avoid escalation, saying, quote, Lebanon cannot become another Gaza. His comments came as Paris looks to play a role in reviving diplomatic efforts. France's foreign minister is currently on a four-day trip to the Middle East, which will wrap up in Israel on Monday. Meanwhile, thousands protesters across the Americas to demand a ceasefire in Gaza and end the conflicts in the Middle East. 
Hundreds descended on downtown Detroit, joining thousands of protesters who took to the streets in major cities around the world demanding an end to the bloodshed in Gaza and the wider Middle East as the start of Israel's war in the Palestinian enclave approaches its first anniversary. Scores of pro-Palestinian demonstrators also took to the streets in Washington, D.C. and Toronto in a show of support for Palestinians and people in Lebanon. In Mexico City, protesters marched with banners and Palestinian flags held high, urging newly inaugurated Mexican President Claudia Scheinbaum to break diplomatic and economic ties with Israel. The latest bloodshed in the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict was triggered when Palestinian Hamas militants attacked southern Israel on October 7, 2023, killing more than 1,000 people and taking about 250 as hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Israel's subsequent military assault on Gaza has killed nearly 42,000 Palestinians, according to Gaza's health ministry. It has also displayed nearly all of the enclave's 2.3 million people and caused a hunger crisis led to genocide allegations at the World Court, which Israel denies. Moving on to the war in Ukraine now. Russia, for a second consecutive day, attacked a civilian vessel in a Ukrainian Black Sea port. According to media report, reports, a Palau flagship was hit by a Russian ballistic missile in Odessa. A Palau flagged ship was hit by a Russian ballistic missile in Odessa. Reports say the strike killed one Ukrainian employee of a private cargo handling company and injured five foreign nationals. It's the second such strike by Moscow in southern Ukraine this week after it attacked a civilian vessel loaded with corn on Sunday. Russia has been targeting Ukrainian grain exports since withdrawing from the Black Sea Grain Initiative in July last year. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news right after this. And finally tonight, a new wearable stroke rehabilitation device aims to help patients regain motor control of limbs lost following a stroke. Embedded with electrodes that detect muscle activation, its developers hope it can help rewire a patient's brain. A stroke four years ago left Lisa Vincent's left arm immobile and rigid. But the 52-year-old patient is one of the first to test a novel rehabilitation device that's helping her regain the movement she lost. Vincent and three other patients from a stroke support group in London have been working with researchers from New Bond, a spin-out from Imperial College London, for about two months. The prototype wearable tech is strapped around the forearm. It's embedded with electrodes that detect muscle activation and stimulators that activate the patient's nerves, which as Newborn's co-founder Junpei Kashiwakura explains, helps rewire the patient's brain to the limb. After just eight sessions with the device, Lisa Vincent's left arm has gone from completely rigid to being able to bend and flex with much more control. Co-founder and CEO Patrick Sagastegi hopes once certified, the device can be used anywhere and integrated into daily routines. The early results are promising, but a larger trial will begin next year at a London hospital to validate the device's effectiveness. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest updates across the globe. Stay tuned as Sanwe Mudan Naika will join you next with the nightly business report. Until then, have a good night.